Welcome back to another episode of the Six Ps podcast. We're going to continue with our look at the seven stages of grieving by today going through scenes 10 to 17. As is custom, we're going to start with some pre-reading information and a brief summary of those scenes. Part two, we'll read through those particular scenes before closing with a brief analysis and once again, I'll emphasize the word brief. There is a lot that you could analyze from each scene, but we'll just touch on a couple of things and encourage you to go into more detail in your own individual analysis. So remember, there is only one character in this text, only one actress on the stage, and that is the woman, though she offers perspectives from a range of other characters and will be introduced to a few of those later on today, including Auntie Grace. The sets are really minimal, but props and sound effects will add lots of meaning and detail, particularly around the characters' thoughts and feelings and reactions to certain events that happen. It is a non-linear structure, and that is, I guess, outlined through the sound effects of the chair scraping against the wooden floor and the, and the footsteps and the door closing and the clock ticking. So. That's our cue to know that we're going to the past. In fact, that's where we're going to start today with our first two scenes. And just a reminder that stage directions are in italics. In fact, they're in italics and bold in this version. And they're really, really important in understanding the performance and also a little bit around the context of each scene. So remember, you can definitely quote stage directions. In fact, I would be thinking that you'd be at least including one quotation that is a stage direction in your comparative essays. All right, let's run through some brief summaries of each scene that we're going to look at today. The first one is Invasion Poem. It's where the woman recites a poem which describes British settlement of Australia and the impact of this on First Nations people that is quite graphic as well. We then shift slightly in tone to the next scene, 1788 which is the year the first fleet arrived in Botany Bay. And this is a flashback to that arrival, but it's a lot more of a colloquial and humorous tone. Very, very short scene, that one. Scene 12 is Murray gets a dress. This is again, a bit of a comedic scene. Um, a little bit sad to an extent too, because it recounts a woman's experiences of buying a dress and the discrimination she faces. In fact, she faces discrimination later on in this scene as well by police through a misunderstanding. Uh, again, she sort of shakes it off through humour, but it does allow the audience to reflect on these incidents. Scene 13 is called Auntie Grace, and it is about that particular character. And the woman tells a story of her. Um, she's a distant relative who lives in London, and she returns for Nana's funeral. She doesn't really fit in with the family. She's lost her connection in terms of, of culture and of family. And um, ultimately, at the end of this particular scene, she does weep and sort of reclaims that connection to her family and her culture. Scene 14 is a story of an Indigenous teenager who dies in police custody. A really horrific scene. Following that, we've got scene 15, which is March, which sort of explores an activist protest involving about 6,000 people speaking out against racism. The penultimate scene we'll look at today is scene 16, very short scene, it's called Bargaining. It's literally one line of dialogue where the audience is asked about the worth of land. And we'll finish today with Home Story, where the woman explains the complex nature of kinship systems, particularly to the non-Indigenous audience, and hints at the impact that colonisation has played on these. In terms of the key themes for the scenes we're looking at today, Racism and discrimination will be particularly pre prevalent through most of these scenes. Uh, grief as well uh, with family, uh, particularly when it comes to Auntie Grace. We'll look at loss of death, loss and death in that scene as well. Uh, towards the end, we will look at justice and, and equality, particularly when it comes to scenes like March. And this will sort of continue throughout the last part of this text as well. There's a real shift away from, I guess, grief and more into you know, equality, justice, power, and those sorts of themes. Scene 10, Invasion Poem. A shaft of light from a half-open door frames the woman. 
A chair scrapes across a wooden floor. Footsteps recede. A door closes. A clock ticks. They come in the front door, smiling, offering gifts. I invited them in. They demanded respect. They sat in my father's seat and talked to me of things that made no sense. I nodded, listened, gave them my ear as I was always taught to. Without warning, they broke from our soft, whispered conversation. One took a handful of my hair and led my head to their knee. Another washed his face in my blood. Together they chained my feet. My feet. My children, stolen away to a safe place, were wrenched from familiar arms and forced to feed upon an another tongue. The protests of my mother's mother cut short, silenced by a single wave of a stick. Told not to speak, not to dance, told not to do what we have always done. I lie painfully sleepless in a landscape of things I know are sacred, watching unsympathetic wanderings. To wonder is to think, to wander is to walk. The woman retrieves her dress. Scene 11, 1788. The date 1788 appears. Oi, hey you, don't you be waving back at me. Yeah, you with that hat. You can't park here, eh? You're taking up the whole bloody harbour. Just get in your boat and go. Go on. Go on, get. Scene 12. Murray gets a dress. Delivered in the style of stand-up comedy. Have you ever been black? You know when you wake up one morning and you're black. Happened to me this morning. I was in the bathroom, looking in the mirror. Hey, nice hair, beautiful black skin, white shiny teeth. I'm black. You get a lot of a lot of attention, special treatment when you're black. I'm in this expensive shop and there's this guy next to me. Nice hair, nice tie, nice suit, waving a nice big pump you full of hole semi-automatic gun in the air and the shop assistants are all looking at me. Keep an eye on the black one. Eye on the black one. Okay. So I went to try on a dress and the shop assistant escorts me to the special dressing room, the one equipped with video cameras, warning to shoplifters, a security guard, F and sniffer dog. Get out of it. Just so I don't put anything I shouldn't on my nice dress, nice hair, beautiful black skin and white shiny teeth. Now I'm in this crowded elevator, bathed in perfume, in my nice dress, nice hair, beautiful black skin and white shiny teeth. Hey, which way? The woman sniffs the air. Someone budgie and they all look at me. Ah, uh, knock off. Now, I go to my deadly Datsun, looking pretty deadly myself. Which way? Lock my keys in the car. Ah, uh, but this Murray too good. She got a coat hanger in her bag. Fiddling around for a good or oh, five seconds, and started hearing sirens. Look around, policemen on bikes, policemen in cars, policemen jumping out of helicopters and that same effing sniffer dog. Get out of it, it's my car. So I'm driving along in my car. Car breaks down, get out. Start waving people for help, vroom. Imitating a fast car. Waving for help, vroom. Help, vroom. Finally get home, foot falcon job and I'm still looking deadly in my nice dress, nice hair, beautiful black skin and white shiny teeth. Auntie comes in. Hey sis girl, you bought a new dress. Too bad it makes you look fat. I go to bed thinking tomorrow will be a better day. Snuggling up to my doona and pillow. Morning comes, I wake up. I go into the bathroom, I look in the mirror. Hey, nice hair, beautiful black skin, white shiny teeth. 
I'm still black and deadly. Scene 13, Auntie Grace. The woman pulls the suitcase out of the grave. Placing it before her on the floor, she opens it. She looks up at the audience. Auntie Grace came back especially for Nana's funeral. I'd only known this woman through Nana's collection of photographs. They were never displayed with the other members of our family. They were only brought out on request when any of the older cousins asked about family history. The pictures always showed the two sisters together, going to a social or party. Auntie Grace was beautiful, a half head taller than a younger sister, slender and almost inevitably dressed in white, teeth glowing extra white in the two-tone capture of the moment. My father went to pick up Auntie Grace from the airport and dropped her at a hotel. She wasn't going to stay with the rest of us, that was very clear. Auntie Grace lives in London. She's lived there for almost 50 years. I'd never met her, though I'm told I had when I was a baby. No one really talked of her, but she seemed to know about all of us, remembering names and quoting our parents' names and guessing ages. Her features well preserved, her skin gone pale for want of sun, and though she looked like no one in particular from the family, she fit in to the look of all of us. The skinny ankles, the line of her shoulders, and that nose. I never saw her the, cry the whole time she was with us. Dad said she was stuck up and wasn't really family. She married this Englishman after World War II. There's a photo of her on a ship, waving with this white fella, his arm around her. For some reason, she didn't stay, which is strange. My family has always lived here. Nana used to say, just when all our men were coming home and we had our share to bury too, she upped and left us. The black princess sipping tea with the queen. Now, I'm a Christian woman and I forgive her, but no more. No more talking of her. I drive Auntie Grace out to the cemetery on our way to the airport. She doesn't have much luggage. There is plenty of room in the back seat, but no one comes to see her off. I wait in the car while she goes out to the freshly turned soil of Nana's grave. She's there for such a long time. I think we're going to be late. Finally, she comes back to the car, opens the back door and removes her suitcase. She opens it, throwing the contents all over the ground. Everything. Dragging the empty suitcase, the lid slapping her legs, she sits at the grave. The woman begins to fill the case with red earth from the grave. Crying. At last, crying. The woman collects herself and places the suitcase on top of the disturbed grave. Scene 14. Mugshot. Delivered in the style of a court report, with no hint of emotion. On 7th November 1993, Daniel Vockey together with Joseph Blair, Damien Bond, Lindsay Fisher, Archie Gray, Glenn Gray, Charles Riley, Edward Riley and Daniel Weasel went to Southbank. After an altercation between Vockey and an unknown person, the group left Southbank and travelled to Musgrave Park. Some alcohol was purchased at the Melbourne Hotel and consumed by the group in Musgrave Park. Whilst the group was in Musgrave Park, Constables Domro and Harris were patrolling the area surrounding the park. The group came to their attention allegedly because they were abusive and one of them exposed himself. After a period of time, the group left the park. Shortly after leaving the park, Weasel and Edward Riley left the group and proceeded along Russell Street to return to the Bain Street Hostel whilst the balance of the group travelled down Edmondson Stone Street with a view of going to the Oxford Street Hostel. This group was followed by Damro and Harris as they proceeded down Edmundstone Street across Melbourne Street to a nearby area known as SEQEB Park on the corner of Boundary and Brereton Street's west end. Before the group reached the location, Harris made a number of calls on the radio, police radio seeking assistance, firstly from a Dutton Park car and thereafter from any car in the vicinity. A Dutton Park Crime Squad vehicle containing Acton Sergeant Symes and Senior Constable Bishop 
responded to the general call for assistance. The group entered SEQEB Park and Damro and Harris waited at or near a stop sign near the junction of Boundary and Edmundstone Streets. As soon as Symes and Bishop arrived, they drove into Brereton Street, where both vehicles stopped near SEQEB Park. The woman stops abruptly, looks as if she was about to speak out, then resumes reading. The group dispersed. Vocky ran but was intercepted and arrested by Symes. In the course of the arrest, Vocky went to ground. Bishop and Harris then pursued members of the group towards the hostel, leaving Symes and Damro with Vocky. Shortly after the arrest, Vocky, another Dutton Park vehicle containing Sergeant Crowley and Constable Crozier, arrived at the scene. Crowley handcuffed Vocky's hands behind his back. Crowley and Symes then left Damro and Crozier with Vocky and drove down to the Oxford Street Hostel. At the hostel, there was a struggle between police and a group of youths. After remaining on the ground for some time with Damro and Crozier, Vocky was driven to the hostel. The woman finally breaks out. Pe people called him Bunny. He was known as Bunny. She stops herself and continues to read tonelessly. By this time, other police had arrived at the scene, including Constable Carris, Constable Leidendeckers, Sergeant Whittaker, and Senior Constable Parker. After the incident at the hostel, police patrolled the area for at least 17 minutes, looking for other alleged offenders. Two vehicles and travelled to the Brisbane City Watch House. In this section, the woman breaks away from the written word. This requires the actor to improvise the text in her own words. On Vocky's arrival at the watch house, his condition aroused immediate concern. When they looked closer, they saw that he wasn't breathing. He didn't have any pulse. The people at the watch house didn't know what to do, so they called an ambulance. The ambulance got there and they had to pump needles into him. They were pounding his chest, giving mouth to mouth while the others stood back and watched. They took him to Royal Brisbane Hospital, pounding and pushing his limp body. The woman returns to the written word. The resuscitation attempts were unsuccessful, and at 7.13pm, he was pronounced dead. Scene 15, March. The woman stands strong. Her body rocks with the rising pace of the march. The call went out. Faxes, mobile phones, leaflets, word of mouth, Photocopiers running over time. Flash. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The news was out. Musgrave Park, 9am. A peaceful march. A silent march. Thousands. Stretched out. We're not fighting. We're grieving. I'm in a crowd. I'm in a crowd of people all walking. I'm in a crowd of people all walking along in silence. I'm in a crowd of people all walking along in silence. My dad, my brothers and sisters and my nana. No one speaks, no one yells. Everyone just walks together. If you feel like fighting, if you feel like yelling, grab it in your hand and show your grief. Lift it up and show the world. I'm walking along and all I can hear is a shuffle of shoes. Everyone is too busy thinking about what it means to be here. Four helicopters circle the crowd. Declaiming news headlines. Defiant Aboriginal March. Aboriginal March. Traffic stopper. No one said this about the FN Santa Parade the week before. Hey, we're going to be on TV. Frightened. Hey, we're going to be on TV. Smile for the police camera. We come from a long tradition of storytelling. If this is the only way we can get our story told. This huge gathering stops outside the police watch house in Herschel Street. And we sit. Quiet. Roma Street crowd gather to watch. The family sing, dance and smoke out the spirit and the dancers play their clapsticks. The rhythm engulfs the crowd. The beat echoes round the buildings. Like if at last the song was coming from the ground to swallow everything in revenge. The clapsticks ring out alone at first. I'm in the crowd and we all clap as we rise, as we walk. 6,000 people in rhythm, pounding at the road, but we're not yelling, 
we're not fighting, we're grieving. A whistle rings out. The high-pitched ones you can only do if you hold your lips really tight. The clapsticks, the singing, the clapping, the pounding of our feet, and the piercing ring of whistles. The woman stands, her arms raised defiantly. Don't tell me we're not fighting. Don't tell me we don't fight most of our lives. Scene 16. Bargaining. The sound of hammering. The woman slams a nail through two pieces of wood. She stands and carries a wooden cross over to the grave. As she drives it into the red earth, the words for sale are revealed. What is it worth? Scene 17. Home Story. The woman takes several handfuls of red earth from the grave, making a large pile on the floor. Now I want to tell you a story. I'll tell you how it was told to me. Now, it's very complex. I get it wrong sometimes. I'm no expert, but I'll try to explain it the best I can so you'll have stay with me. It's all got to do with family, culture and language and stuff. Are you with me? The pile here is the land, the source, the spirit, the core of everything. Are you with me on that? The woman makes a circle around the pile. And this one here is about culture, family, song, tradition, dance. Have you got that? Then came the children. Everyone has their place. Now, this is where it gets complicated, so you'll have to stay with me. The woman makes eight smaller piles around the larger pile within the circle. You always have to marry within your own skin. If I was part of this pile here, that would mean this pile would be my mother because you always follow the line of the woman. And this pile could be my father, or this one, which makes this one and this one here my grandparents and cousins. Now, if I was to marry, I couldn't marry from the same pile because they would be my brothers and sisters. But I could marry this pile here because they're my cousins, which makes this pile my children because you always follow the line of the woman. Are you with me? I'll explain that again. This mob and this mob can marry because they're grandparents and cousins. You can't marry this mob because they're your brothers and sisters. And you can't marry this mob or this mob because they're your children, because you always follow the line of the woman. You can't marry this one, this one or this one, because that's like marrying your father. The only ones you could marry are... Wait a minute. This mob and this mob can marry because they're grandparents and cousins. You can't marry this mob because they're your brothers and sisters. And you can't marry this mob or this mob because they're your children, because you always follow the line of the woman. You can't marry this one, this one or this one because it's like marrying your father. The only ones I could marry are this mob or this mob. Are you with me? The woman gathers up the smaller piles and relocates them on the white fringing that defines a black performing area. Now imagine when the children are taken away from this. Are you with me? The woman flays her arms through the remaining large pile and circle, destroying it. All right, let's go through some brief analysis of these scenes. And we'll start with scene 10, Invasion Poem, which is, I guess, a bit of a metaphor. The British settlement is compared to inviting a guest into your home. And we see the woman is quite cordial, quite nice in inviting these people in before essentially um, receiving a hostile welcome, a disrespectful welcome, really. Uh, and this exacerbates the pain, the suffering and trauma experienced by the First Nations peoples. I think what's interesting is the stage direction of a half open door. This notion that the door is open for the colonists, that the Indigenous people do extend that olive branch, but it's completely disregarded. Um, we looked at doorways and doors as a symbol of change or transition. Um, perhaps the fact that it's half open even sort of talks about the forceful nature of settlement and colonisation and what follows from that. Anyway, something for you to think about. Just note in this poem the verbs that are used. They're quite brutal. Chained, stolen, wrenched, forced, silent, cut short, lie painfully. 
This is, of course, to describe the experiences of the First Nations people. Um, obviously, poetry is used here as well, and you can connect that to Long West memory. And there's sort of, you know, some connections to the experiences felt by Cook and Chapel in terms of, you know, only one took a handful of my hair and led my head to their knee, like that to Cook, and, you know, silence by a single wave of the stick. We can obviously reference that to Chapel as well and the use of the whip. In scene 11, a very short scene, very different tone, uh, much more colloquial and comical. Uh, the person he is speaking, and again, it's in quotation marks, so someone else's voice, um, sort of treats colonists like a pet or a fly even, like go away, shoo. And I've written their dramatic irony. Um, the audience obviously knows the consequences of colonisation and what followed. So there is a bit of dramatic irony there from the audience, which obviously exudes a sense of sadness or evokes a sense of sadness in the audience about this. Scene 12 is Murray gets a dress and it's a really different vibe from the others. And I guess the stage directions there where it sort of talks about delivered in the style of stand up comedy really sort of emphasizes that, you know, stand up comedy is essentially about, you know, taking moments from your life and, and telling them in a humorous way. And, and while humor is used by, by Murray in her everyday experiences, again, we're touched with a tinge of sadness as the audience about what she has to sort of deal with. Um, she's able to laugh off the racism. You know, she's closely watched while buying a dress. You know, even though she looks really pretty and really beautiful compared to the other shopper there, uh, who is described as, you know, having a nice hair, a nice tie, a nice suit, waving a nice big pump, you're full of holes, semi-automatic gun. Uh, a description there which we looked at, which very similar to what Maxine Bonneba Clark did in Foreign Soil. Um, and the difference in treatment that she receives as to everyone else. Obviously, later on, she locks her keys in a car and has a coat hanger because, again, it's seen that she's quite uh, resourceful. She's quite prepared, but actually it's seen by police um, as having the opposite effect, they assume that she's trying to break into a car. Note as well the repetition of policemen, so policemen on bikes, policemen in cars, policemen jumping out of helicopters, uh, the extreme force that is used by the police and by institutions on First Nations people is emphasised through that. There's also something towards the end where she sort of faces this racism and discrimination during the day and then she gets home and her mother even has a go at her, her mother sort of, I guess, sasses her, I've written there, trying to think of a better word than, than sass, but um, sort of shows that she still faces the same issues that every sort of, you know, young person or young child sort of faces in terms of body image. So the fact that she has to deal with racism on top of the everyday teenage issues, um, again, evokes a sense of sadness, even though she uses humour to sort of deal with it. But the use of capital letters in the ending, I'm still black and deadly, is quite empowering and leaves us with this notion that this is how Murray deals with the situation. Um, although it's sad that that's how she deals with it, um, we can see that she is she has a sense of agency over how she deals with it. And scene 13 is about Auntie Grace. She struggles with her cultural identity. She left Australia 50 years ago. She's sort of been westernised. I've mentioned uh, the word in the motifs, the fact that she almost inevitably dressed in white, that her teeth were glowing extra white, uh, and there's something else about her skin has gone pale. The use of white there sort of symbolizes assimilation. So it is in fact her name. So Auntie Grace gets a name. None of the other characters really do. Um, you know, we've got an old auntie, a father, a brother. We've got the woman. Auntie Grace gets a name, which sort of emphasizes the way she's been westernized or anglicized, you might say as well. Again, she doesn't quite fit in. They mention the fact that she doesn't stay with the family like the rest of us. The fact she even grieves differently. She might look similar to them. They mention that even her nose is a little bit similar, but she doesn't deal with the grief in the same way. It says on page 39, I never saw her cry the whole time she was with us. The fact that line is on its own, it's its own sort of paragraph, emphasizes the difference and the lack of connection she has to that family. But by the end of the scene, she's crying. And we see that reconnection back to family and to culture when she's at her nana's grave. And note that it's her suitcase that is filled with red earth from her nana's grave. You could suggest that 
you know, emptying her suitcase is sort of relieving the baggage and the trauma that she sort of feels and that the tears and the crying allows her a sense of catharsis and the chance to sort of reconnect. Sad that it happens after the death of her nana, but nonetheless, she's able to do it, suggesting that denying your identity is ultimately quite scarring. We move to scene 14, the story about Daniel Vocchi, who is sort of charged by police, taken into the watch house and, and dies. And it alludes to actually a real incident that happened uh, with a person called Daniel Yockey. So similar name um, and same experiences. It's a court report style in this case, which with no hint of emotion is the stage direction. So there is a real lack of humanity in this. I've written there next to police report, it lacks detail, emotion and humanity. And it's sort of juxtaposed by the woman who calls out in the middle of the court report, people called him Buddy. He gives him a name, he gives him an identity, he gives him sort of humanity in that case. There is obviously a reference here to deaths in incarceration, which are particularly high for Indigenous people. And something else I wanted to mention was at the very, very end, when the woman sort of breaks out and she sort of describes that the people at the watch house didn't know what to do, so they called an ambulance. The ambulance got there and they had to pump needles into him and they were pounding his chest and giving him mouth to mouth while the others stood back and watched. There's this sense of a lack of accountability here from the police particularly, that they don't do anything about this, that they're the ones who are actually accountable for it, but are never held to that account again, questioning these institutions, which has happened a few times throughout this play. In scene 15, now I've written structure there because it appears directly after Daniel's death. Now, there's no clear correlation between the two scenes, apart from the fact that, you know, Daniel happens to be at Musgrave Park and the march is at Musgrave Park. We could perhaps make that connection that this march could potentially be about his death and deaths in incarceration. The repetition of the phrase, we're not um, fighting, that we're grieving, sorry, I misspelled that, um, we're grieving, uh, is really important. Again, this is how they have to release their, their grief by marching. And you'll notice it's a march that is in silence, that they're not yelling, that they're walking together, that it's a collegial experience. I've noted there the use of the media and the two media headlines. So define Aboriginal march and Aboriginal march traffic stopper. The idea that this is a peaceful march but isn't reported by the media as being that is really important in, again, discussing institutions, in this case, the media, um, who, like the police, aren't held to account for the way that they handle these situations. Scene 16 is, is really, really powerful. Um, it's a really short scene, but one that I definitely encourage students to analyse where possible. There's a double meaning in both the title of the scene, which is bargaining, and also that the one line in the scene, what is it worth? So in terms of bargaining, it's the third stage of grieving. And in a way, you're sort of appeasing your oppressors. We can also, I guess, analyze the word bargain being something that's quite cheap. And we could potentially relate that to, to land, land that's taken from First Nations people. We then have the double meaning of the dialogue. What is it worth? In terms of what is it worth literally? What is the land worth? But also, what is it worth? What's the cost? What's the emotional toll that's taken by First Nations people based on colonization and the dispossession of land? This is really obviously important because this is a message from the playwrights to the audience to really consider what has happened and what action they're going to take. We'll close today with scene 17, home story. Uh, once again, the word story is used in the title of a scene, emphasizing that importance of storytelling. Here, uh, the woman describes the intricate and complex workings of kinship relationships. Now, sorry, kinship systems, which we looked at a little bit with uh, Marbo, the film that we studied last term. Um, 
you know, kinship systems determine how people relate to each other. As a woman tries to explain, she gets mixed up a few times, which again emphasizes the complexity of these kinship systems, but also how intricate they are. Like these are really considered. We speak about the notion of Terranalius, the fact that no one owned the land before British settlement, but there were systems in place for land ownership. They just were different, but they weren't considered to be sort of um, relevant or worthy of acknowledgement, which again highlights the, the, the difference in the way of thinking. But the kinship system did determine things like suitable marriage partners, roles at funerals and burials, which are a significant part of, of culture, everyday behaviour patterns and traditional land ownership groupings. So the woman tries to explain this and she asks the crowd throughout, you know, are you with me on that? As if to say, do you understand what I'm trying to say? You know, are you with me? Do, do, do you get it? But then at the very end, she says, and that, that's great. Now imagine when children are taken away from this. Are you with me? So rather than saying, do you get it? Which she sort of is. She's also saying, are you on my side? Do you understand what I'm feeling? Do you understand what we're all feeling? And she, once again, really challenging the audience to contemplate what has happened. And you'll note that the stage directions here and the white fringing and the black performing area, the colours are really, you know, purposely used here, that the woman flays her arm through the remaining large pile and, and circle and destroying it, which is meant to represent the destruction of culture that has happened since colonisation. All right, some key takeouts from these particular scenes in relation to the comparison with the longest memory. Think about the use of violence. Um, we mentioned the whip from scene 10, the invasion poem, um, but the use of violence by oppressors. So consider the deaths of Chapel and Daniel Vocchi, the motivations, the causes and the consequences. I think they're two characters you can definitely reference and consider discussing in terms of violence. Something that is still pre pre prevalent in today's society, which we saw with the death of George Floyd not long ago. My second point here is that how do individuals react to inherent systemic and intrinsic racism? So consider Chapel, Whitechapel and Cook, especially Chapel and Whitechapel and their very different views on, say, slavery. And then compare that to the seven stages of grieving. How does Murray react to it? How do those that march react to racism? How does a woman react to, to racism throughout the play? Um, and again, th those those different reactions and emotions that characters feel and, and why they feel the way that they do. You could also look at the role of the media that's presented in both texts, particularly about social issues. So the Virginian editorials particularly in The Longest Memory, and you can compare that to the news headlines in scene 15, March. Think about the, right, the role the media play in upholding societal norms. I was thinking as well with Invasion Poem and the Reconciliation Poem that comes up at the end, whether you could compare that to Chapel and his poetry and the really um, negative connotations in both poems in The Longest Memory to show the suffering, the grief, the, the inaction, and compare that to, I guess, the more positive emotion that Chapel sort of feels, the love that he feels from his mother and also from Lydia. So a few things to, to think about with these scenes from Seven Stages of Grieving.